Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to our Parasite video. If you haven't seen that one and you have seen the movie Parasite, then please feel free to check it out because we definitely go into a lot of detail about Ending Explained yep. and some of the symbols and motifs and themes that we encountered through our first viewing of the movie Parasite, which is just such a wonderful one. And I think it's going to be at least on our top five of movies for 2019. Yeah, many people are speculating it is the best movie for 2019. So and we definitely agree with that one. Yeah. So we thought because we had such a great um, reaction to that video. Yeah, and great response from you guys. Yeah, great response and some really interesting extra tidbits that we hadn't picked up on, at least with our viewing of Parasite. We thought to enrich our viewing, of our second viewing of yeah. Parasite. Our second and discussion. Yeah. We thought we might be a little bit generous and share those same insights that you guys have come up with and compile them all together. And discuss. And yeah, yeah talk and see if we've got any additional things to say. Um, so we won't actually mention any commenters by name just in case you guys want to stay private. But we just want to say thank you very much. And without further ado, I guess we start talking about the comments themselves. And if we have any additional takes on it, then we'll do that. Yeah. So I think the first great comment that was pointed out um, was they said the scene where the family is getting wasted while the parks are camping reminds um, the commenter of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Well, this was such a great takeaway. First of all, I think from that Goldilocks and Three Bears being a very fairy tale, yep. kindergarten-y perspective in yep. the vein of the little boy. Almost slightly ridiculous. As well. yeah. yeah, but also that kind of very um, mischievous feasting of Goldilocks when she sort of is not really thinking about the fact that these three bears are really quite dangerous and also in in this particular instance are responsible for their well health and well-being so if the three bears come home find that their beds have been slept in and that their porridge has been eaten they're gonna pounce on Goldilocks yeah and Goldilocks as the parasites kind of requires the host to still be the host, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, 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 I think it's that that nexus between the host being the provider of those things, as long as, and the parasite being able to be parasitic in that way, as long as they don't um, agitate the host enough to, mm. to warrant a response. And so... Fumigate um, their body. Yeah, yeah, and so, uh, yeah, or to start looking for the parasite, and we see mm. that that starts to happen. So even in Goldilocks and the Three Bears, the bears come in, would have been fine except they notice that someone's been eating their porridge someone's been doing whatever the other thing is and then someone's been sleeping in their beds and it's only when they know that that prompts a reaction so i think that's that's quite um that's quite poignant to to what um happens in the film as well mm. and that um the parasites are able to kind of just cruise around it until they start um doing things that that let the host know that they're there well i remember i felt a real sense of unease when they were in the middle of feasting because i just thought if these guys come home it's over it's over and no. they had just such a spread they weren't really thinking about kind of containing their they were, feasting they were gorging they were gorging without thinking about how this might look if someone comes in so I don't know, I would have felt like I would have um, made sure that each ev everything was easy to clean up yeah. as in case someone so I could just sweep yeah. in case someone came in so I could just sweep it under the table. But they seemed like they were more really focused, I guess, the way a parasite or a bug would not thinking about the danger that may await at any a moment's notice. Like Goldilocks. Yeah, poor Goldilocks. The same commenter actually mentioned something completely different as well, which is definitely worth a call out. The metaphor of respect in this movie is profound. We would agree with that. We did uh, mention in the um, last video the idea of like the rich guy definitely having something to say about the station or the poor guy knowing his station, but then at the same time smelling like an old rag yeah and that was where the disrespect started to creep in but also that the rich man thought it was respectful of the poor people to know their station yeah to defer yeah i agree and i think what what kind of um the poor dad is contented in being um respected as the driver for the family and that's all right he understands that the um rich dad use him at a lower station but he still respects him for what the the activity that he performs and, and that he does it well it's only when he understands that or learns that although the the rich dad does respect his driving ability that he still has a, a slight contempt for him because you know he smells funny and you know he finds that smell offensive and blah 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 and that ultimate disrespect i think is what kind of is the trigger for for our poor dad stabbing the rich dad mm. 
Yeah. yeah. Maybe he feels like he's being disrespected. It's yeah. the last straw. Yeah, yeah, completely. So another commenter, I'm just going to read out the comment directly and then we can, if we sure. have any extra takeaways from that one. They're so below everyone, even their toilet is above them. So this person's Point. talking yeah. about yeah, poor the family. poor family and how they were completely underneath everyone else when they were living in the kind of sewers, basically. Um, see how the dogs follow the first housemaid, how this woman moves around the house and her gestures. The boy thought she was the house owner at first. I definitely got that yep. um, yeah. idea as well. Her and the mad uh, man, I guess, yep. lived so long in a rich house they even began to understand art. Definitely, that's a great pickup. I remember when um, the first housemaid was corresponding, I think, with the guy or the architect. Who, who, I don't know. She, she calls it, the commenter called it the mad man. And I'm wondering whether she There's means a husband, the, the maid's husband. husband. Yeah. And was the husband responsible for the architectural design of the house, or was that someone completely different? No, that's different? someone completely different. Yeah. Because it yeah. seemed as if the housemaid, whether she was talking to the the um, her mad husband or whether she was talking to the actual architect of the house, definitely was indicating that she um, understood art. Yeah, I'm not, that, I'm, not, I'm not. Do you remember that conversation? Yeah. Uh, um, what I remember is that she's taught that. Um, so what, where it really comes out is that when the former maid confronts the poor family when they're having that kind of splash out session and just gorging all their stuff, she and she kind of says that you know of all the things that you guys could kind of do in this house, it's like you, you just kind of eat and get really drunk. Mm. You don't have an appreciation for the art. And when you um, when they do the flashbacks, um, the maid and the mad husband they appreciate the the art that they the piece of art that they're actually living in. Mm. Um, and I think from memory, it's, it's through the maid um, and her husband had hoodwinked um, uh, the original rich family that they had, had just kind of been um, almost uh, squatting in the house and then convinced them that they were a maid and things like that. So, mm. um, yeah, that, that, that part was quite interesting. Um, yeah, I, I thought that it's interesting from this perspective that the art elevates them. And I think we did mention that in the last video um, that... They might have started out low, but they feel like they're kind of yeah, like a Maslow's hierarchy up, needs. Yeah, yeah, up the ladder once they reach that next point of consciousness, I guess. Um, another mention is how Rich Dad hates the line crossing. Yep, and that smell kept crossing the line. But funny enough, oh, this one's a really good call out. They keep the underwear of a random girl, so this is the Rich Dad, I think, and they even touch it and smell it. So I couldn't yeah, that remember bit, that. that was a bit that's funny. Gross. Rich father hates the smell and criticized the poor man who got, which got him killed. But when the poor wife compares his, her husband to a cockroach, he almost hit her. But he loves his wife too. They're in it together. So family <sighs> before everything. Yep. It's definitely good. that theme of family. Yep. Carrying over. And it's interesting. I'm thinking about it now and I'm just thinking about how, yes, the rich family were rich in wealth, but were they rich in family? Because the poor family definitely have that connection together, whereas the rich family in certain ways are very separated from each other. The man going to work, the um, child with uh, his psychological issues, the um, teenage girl and her kind of like studying to go to some great university or something. Did you get anything like that? Uh, I got that the... the, the um, that the director showed us that. Um, so if you think about we only ever see... Uh, we see the poor family together and we never see the rich family with the poor family sprinkled in. We never see their kind of um, family time with the ex um, outside of all that. And that was maybe intentionally done to demonstrate that point. Yeah. Um, another shot that caught my eye is that the Mad Men has put a photo of Park in a pyramid of empty cans just beside Nelson Mandela. Didn't even notice that. Yeah, I didn't. That might miss I that. Amazing. I missed it, sorry. Also, the effect of disasters uh, through situations on both classes. The Kims lost everything, forced to sleep alongside hundreds of strangers. Yeah, the and then with all his worries in mind, poor dad should go on and play the fool for the rich kid. I think that's really awesome. But it is. He's playing the fool. Yeah. On the other hand, the rich have got a sunny day, so they're happy and they make parties and they dare to hate on the poor father's smell on their way home from the supermarket while wife's feet are up on the seat. Good call. Love that. Yep. Someone else commented, sure this would work as a Western remake as well. Why not? 
I wonder what that would consist of. Who would be cast in the roles and how that would turn out? Who knows? Maybe one day they'll actually make a Western remake. That would be interesting. I think some of the humor um, might not translate. It's a little bit quirky. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, they could definitely do it, but they would need to change some of the stuff, particularly around like the yeah how how they talk about it. They, they could definitely could. Um, I think the other part is I don't think that. Um, Maybe it does. I wouldn't. I don't naturally think that um, our society is um, stratified. It, it, you know, separated between classes. As can much I say as we something? Observe. Can I say something with that? Yes. Uh, maybe not in Australia, but I think it might work well in the UK. So with the classes hierarchy, there's definitely that more separation of classes, or they're more. They seem to be more um, or less like. Australians are very egalitarian or like to be seen to be egalitarian. So you're not any better or any worse than the next person. Whereas I think a lot of the times in the UK, everyone kind of knows their status. Everyone kind of knows their class and work within their class. You don't feel that way? I feel like the UK is like that. Maybe um, 20, 30 years ago. Okay. Um, but yeah, look, look, it's that, that's just my opinion though. But um, Let us know what you guys think of yeah, uh, yeah. UK if you do live in that, whether it's only in certain stations, whether it was something that was 30 years ago and yeah. is now changed. I guess just the fact like that the royal the family and stuff. I don't, no, I, I think like they do have... Uh, differences between classes but who knows maybe there's not so, so much of a separation of upstairs downstairs anymore and everyone just kind of gets along together um, so on the ending someone's written at the New York Film Festival the directors and main actors spoke after the movie and Bong so the director shared that he actually wrote the song in the background when the son was in the basement and the lyrics were something like 564 years because he did the math, and that's how long the son would take to save up to buy the place. <laughs> that's a good one. What a cool dude. But that kind of gives us a little bit of an answer about the ending, that the son actually maybe never gets enough money to buy the house. Well, I think potentially there... Um, and I'm, I can't remember if we spoke about it in the, in the original video or we just spoke about it off camera, is that there's the potential as well as that the son's um, brain damage is that he imagines um, the dad communicating to him through the flickering of the lights and then, you know... Um, having this this plan that's all in his head mm. around a situation that doesn't actually exist. Yeah, it's almost like a potential PTSD or something, yeah. like a trauma that he develops this need to kind of cover it over with the idea that he yeah. may actually be able to afford this Delusions house of grandeur. His dad's yeah. still yeah, in that family unit. Yeah. Um, the Scholar Rock. Okay, this is a good one because we didn't really know what the emphasis was on the rock when we were first discussing this. It says, was for good luck in bringing the family wealth, but instead it caused the destruction of the family, symbolizing that we all latch on to success and want to be wealthy, but eventually success comes with consequences. Yep. It's a really good call out. And I also think just even that's bringing to mind the idea that the rock is such a burden. It's like a Herculean burden that it's so heavy that it becomes more and more heavy as, as you go along. And then it's the one that is actually, you know, it comes down on that person's head. Yeah, that's what yeah. I kind of took as the, the big takeaway as well. It's like, you know, the rock that meant to, is meant to symbolize, you know, um, increasing wealth and things like that is also part of the downfall. So um, if that weapon rock of destruction. Yeah, because if, if the sun didn't get cracked in the head with that rock, he put, they probably would have been able to cover it all up. So Yeah. Do you want to say the next one? Sure. So uh, the next comment was around one comment on the discussion between um, poor dad and rich dad was about food. Uh, when the rich dad is talking about the old housekeeper, he drops that she's always uh, she always ate enough for two. While the dialogue between the two dads helps build the divide between the two classes, it also foreshadows the events to come. It's amazing how the director was able to do so in one scene. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree. I think I think food um, and and things that are lower on that. If I keep referencing Maslow. that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, things that are lower on those needs is when you're high, further up the food chain, you take those lower things for granted. And we definitely do. Mm. For, you know, um, we're lucky enough in that, you know, there's always food in the cupboards. We always have warm beds. We always have a roof over our head. It's not something that I would kind of um, consider in a discussion with a person how, um, f without, you know, really kind of focusing that someone else might not have that. Well, I do take it for granted. I think, yeah, I think it's, it's almost like it's not just taken for granted because it may be that we appreciate food, but it doesn't become the focus of our primal yeah. needs. So the food is there, but it's in the background. It fades out while ever we have an additional thing to focus on. So for example, that art appreciation becomes something that you can focus on yeah. once the food and the shelter and the warmth 
fades to the background and it's just there. Yeah, it always reminds me of this, this joke. It's kind of a joke where it's like um, oxygen is a lot like sex. It's no big deal unless you're not getting any. Agreed. And so it's kind of that that kind of um, both relegation but also elevation of, of a more primal need. Yeah, and once those needs are recognised, it's kind yeah, of like you, don't you think can about deal it. with it. Yeah. It's like when you're healthy. Yep. You don't really realise that you're healthy and how good it is to be healthy until you get sick. Absolutely. And also the fact that if you come from not having a lot of food, that when you see food, you're going to gorge because you don't know when. You, it's that scarcity mindset. You don't know when you're going to get it again. And you probably, I think that indicates that when the um, people are like feasting and gorging, nothing else, everything else fades into the background, including their um, safety. Yeah, and that happens with the poor family when they, they when they roll the dice and get mm. really drunk and eat all the food and it all kind of goes downhill from there. Yeah, and someone else said in response to that comment, ain't really an insult to say she ate for two when she legit took food for two people. <laughs> Just like the run. poor dad did stink, so I can't be mad at the rich father for calling him out for it. Yeah. He probably did stink. I, I have a real problem with um, smells. Why do you look at me when you well, say I that? Well, I just have a very yeah. sensitive nose, so it's it actually is... It, abhorrent for me if someone doesn't smell good yeah just, just look fair at enough it. fair just enough at you. next comment um <laughs> i think it's important to note that south korea as a whole um is a very hierarchical uh, driven nation mm. age is a huge deal huge deal sorry as well as social classes titles etc i definitely think this played a part in the movie i imagine that some sort some of these aspects might not be fully understood through the international audiences because they might not be, uh, they might not know the depth of this hierarchical system. Mm. I very much enjoyed this film. As someone who's been studying the Korean language and culture for almost three years, it was the first movie I ever watched without any English subtitles. Ah, oh, good work. Yeah. Um, I'm not completely fluent, so I did not. Um, I'm not completely fluent, so I did get lost in translation at some parts. That's a really good effort. So uh, we watched it with subtitles, <laughs> but I think um, after only three years to watch a movie like that and to to largely keep um, to keep track of what's happening. I think that's a really good effort. Yeah, I think this particular commenter actually came to our review because they weren't sure whether they um, got these particular tips and stuff yep. like that about the movie correct because they weren't sure whether they, it got lost in translation. So they, they were like, you know, thankfully what I thought was correct. So well done to that commenter. But yeah, also yeah. I really do think it's interesting when they talk about... Um, the international audiences might not know the depth of the hierarchical system. Certainly for me, um, I didn't understand or didn't realize that Korea was, South Korea was such a um, hierarchical system. However, this just is testament to uh, Bong Joon Ho's ability for this film because certainly I understood what was coming across in terms of class. Yeah, even if you didn't, I think, yeah, I completely agree. He did a really good job in. Um, bringing us up to speed in terms of what the status quo is at that stage and then how the various different families kind of interacted in and around those classes. So I think he did, that's a testament um, to his skill. Yeah. Um, do you want to read out the next one? Since uh, I've got a little bit of a cold at the moment, so I'm really struggling keeping <laughs> oh, track. Absolutely love the film. Best this year by far. However, I have to agree with the reviewer you mentioned as Jeffrey. So Jeffrey was a guy who um, seemed to indicate that there were a little bit of uh, amateur or immature parts of the movie. Parts of this film were very far-fetched and required a lot of unlikely scenarios to get there. Yep. For example, the father morse coding every night to his son. Oh, maybe my son will somehow spy on the house from the mountain and see this. Yep. The residents wouldn't stay up past a certain time ever and notice the lights, try to have them fixed. I get that it's a movie and things are allowed to be far-fetched, but sometimes less is more. And I agree with the reviewer that the storytelling was a little childlike in parts. I think with this one, it was both um, a combination of, yes, there is a, um, a quirky slash fantastical element of this. Um, for this situation to actually really happen, yes, there is some type of grounding that it could happen. Um, but, you know, the, the fun of the movie is that it goes a little bit beyond that. The only thing I will say, though, about the Morse coding thing. So one we kind of touched on it just before around potentially that this is um, a delusion or the imagination of the brain damage poor son at the end. However, um, it isn't... So both um, poor dad and poor son knew that the madman was doing this. So the idea is already in both their heads. So all of a sudden, that's not actually a completely r ridiculous idea. And I was also viewing this film... Like my comment. Yeah, yeah. And um, I love a, a differing opinion as much as the next person even though my opinion is clearly correct. Uh, Magical realism, I thought, would be a good answer to why this this kind of happened. So I, I think potentially Bong Joon-ho 
was uh, referring to those more surrealistic, fantastical, as you say, elements of the story to make a point. So I don't necessarily think that we were supposed to expect that this could have happened in any factual, definitive scenario, but that we elevate ourselves to consider those parts of the movie as that more surreal aspect yeah. to bring across a particular message. Yeah, suspending a bit of disbelief just to kind of really hammer home those parts with a little bit of um, eccentricity, I suppose. Yeah. Yep. Um, so this next comment says there are only two people who are parasites. Interesting. The mad husband. Yep. So the mad husband of the first family that's living under the house. The poor father at the ending. The poor family while working ain't parasitic, despite the fact they exploit the gullibility of the rich wife, the rich family still benefit from them. The poor father is the driver, the poor mum is the housemaid, the poor daughter is the art psychiatric, and the poor son as English tutor. Interesting call out, although... It is a good point. It's a good point, but... Is it possible that parasites can still be parasites leeching or sucking from the host when the host is deriving a benefit from them? I, I think, think they're still considered a parasite. I'm not too sure. That almost sounds like a bit more of a symbiotic um, uh, yes. uh, relationship. But I, I think the He's reason the why science, this... science, yeah, biological yeah, science. That old science degree coming out. Mm -hmm. um, I think, though, the, the, the potentially where this parasite part is drawn is that it's all under... Um, Excuse me. It, it, it's all kind of, you know, uh, fake though, in that the dad is not a real driver. He is being the driver, but they're mm. hoodwinking them. The mum yeah. is in the housemate. She's it, hoodwinking that's, them. That's the actually a really tutor. good point. Yeah. Because the fact that I'm like, yes, that's great. If you're deriving a benefit from him being an English tutor, he's, but he's not. He's not. Yeah. Well, he's, or rather his skill is maybe not that of a true English tutor or a true and, art psych and he's just And he's just having a relationship with the daughter. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so yeah, they're yeah. probably not doing so much comprehension as comprehending certain other things. Anyway, next comment. Any explanation to the native Indian reference? It keeps bugging me. So we gave a bit of a, a response to this one. Yep. Really good question. Our initial thoughts are that it could be cowboys and Indians, which is a game children play, but that adults with some context and history understand that there's a severe ending to that conflict that the children are too young to understand. Otherwise, we had some other additional things as well. Yep, so playing uh, cowboys and Indians uh, in that the poor family is playing a game with how they are hoodwinking the rich family. Um, and it's all a game until someone gets hurt. So the poor da daughter, and that ends the game. Or similar to how Indian tribes and nations fought against the Americans and British against um, other Indian tribes, there comes a time when the alliance breaks and you realise that no matter how much you help them, ultimately the Indians, so the poor yeah. family, are on one side and the cowboys, the rich family, are on the other. Yeah, I think that's that's such a good call out as well because I Thank think you. that um, the, it, there is a point where you can pretend you're all well and good together, but then as soon as this, uh, I don't know, the, the differences come to the fore. Stress, yeah, as soon as there's a stressor. You realise how different you actually tribe are. Tribes separate again. Yeah, yeah and absolutely. you're like not on the same side and you've got different values and yeah. morals and Expectations requirements and roles, to yeah. survive. Um, there was another response to that uh, comment. The person who originally posted the comment went onto IMDb and found a review that indicated something about the um, native Indian reference. There is also something about the American Indian theme, a metaphor for dying cultural tra traditions, which are being placed by, I can never say this word, modernity. Yep. So modern society. Yep. Uh, nature is dog eat dog. Or is it homage to an idyllic past where Native American culture was relatively classless. Great call-outs. Great yeah. call-outs all around. That's an interesting one. Um, I think beyond this, it's, this is kind of not really what it's about, but also um, is related to it, though, is that we always do have these um, kind of glorifications a way of um, simpler times in that we think that, you know, they're very lovely and nature <laughs> and everyone's kind of skipping in fields Kumbaya. of roses and things like that. Um, a lot of those, what we kind of uh, view in, in this lens as primitive cultures or older cultures, they were just as class-based, if not more class-based, mm. in that, you know, they had... Uh, so if we look at the Native Americans, and this is this is by nowhere any uh, means an uh, area of my expertise, but they did have classes in that you had chiefs, you had what would be um, close to, uh, akin to like a royal family, you had the medicine people, you had shamans, um, you had hunters, uh, people that, you know... 
look after the camp. You had warriors. The, the, those are classes that existed. And so um, classes aren't something that is either just a Western thing or a relatively new invention either. If anything, I think classes were probably stronger as we go back in time with the only exception being, you know, in true kind of hunter-gatherers. Yeah. You're a hunter or gatherer. Mm. Or both. I guess, no. Probably. No. <laughs> um, so someone else just randomly commented, Rich Daughter, what happened in the end? So they think that uh, she survived with her mother. So her rich mother. So I, yeah, I can I see think, that happening. I think that was right, yeah. I don't think there was enough of a um, an impact on the story that the rich daughter made. It's not really about them. So it, yeah, she, she can survive. Yeah. That's fine. That doesn't, um, it doesn't comment either way, really. Yeah. doesn't give a message. No, I agree. Um, a couple of additional things that we didn't pick up on the first time that we watched it. I think you had a couple of good call outs. Yeah. I think, um, someone just mentioned that there was a quote that they really loved in the movie. The rich family is so kind and friendly. They could choose to be kind because they're rich. Yep. I was like, that's so true. Yep. It really resonated, but you know, that's, yep. that's just me. <laughs> um, another fun fact about the movie, the scene where the son was teaching the father how to act is hilarious to South Koreans specifically because the actor playing the father, so I think it's Kang Ho Song, is a veteran that's renowned in Korean cinema, while the son, Choi Woo Shik, is just a newcomer. That's pretty cool. So Bong Joon Ho describes it as imagine if Ansel Elcourt was um, teaching acting to Al Pacino. Yeah, yeah. Okay, That's I get a good that. One. I like that. Funny. Yeah. And another final fact about this movie that you may or may not know is that they built that entire house that the rich family lives in for the production of this movie specifically. I like that one. That's architectural genius. I wonder if it's on the market. Would you buy it? Yeah, absolutely. That's I thought why, it was beautiful. That's why all our accounts are two to sign. Mm, all right. <laughs> so, well, guys. Yeah. Let us know if you have any other comments in the blow, uh, below. Sorry. Um, and if you have <laughs> um, you know, anything that we kind of answered or responded to, if you have any different opinion, let us know. While yeah. you're there, hit like. Hit subscribe. And we will see you next time. Bye.